But increasing our ability to organize and communicate inter-human augmentation is important too, right? Take the internet. The internet upgraded our individual knowledge by giving us easy access to Wikipedia. It's given us better opinions than we could have come up with without it. The global brain that Steve Amahandra talked about, yet without upgrading any of us individually. So these kinds of, call it culture, call it interhuman augmentation, upgrading our forms of social organization, that's transhumanity too, and it matters. There's kind of a whole package of new ways of looking at things that have become popular lately, right? There's the long tail, mass customization with, with fabrication like the rep rap pictured, humanity plus using tech to make us healthier, smarter, and happier, quantified self and the self-experimentation movement, the culture of startups, which is really like one step above self-experimentation, experimenting in groups of two, three, four, five people. All of these kind of future-focused, science-focused, decentralized trends. Meanwhile, we see government power becoming more and more centralized, less and less customized. We see the opposite movement. And I'm going to try to explain briefly why that is and how we can fix it. Some people say, well, fix government. Does it like need fixing? I mean, things are a lot better here than, than they are in Haiti. And for less technophilic audiences, I give a more detailed explanation because they don't understand technology and progress. But for all of you, I'm just going to try to explain how governance is a technology. Because you all know that when something is a technology, it can be improved. So government is the technology of social organization. It's a set of rules and institutions that we use to resolve disputes, protect us, and provide for the common good. A law is kind of like a protocol. It's a set of rules that structures our interaction. It's, it's a written procedure, which makes it just like any manufacturing process, any computer program, or any chip design. It's a technology. In fact, not only is it a technology, it's an information technology, like code. When Dubai created their Jebel Ali free trade zone, they hired a retired British common law judge to administer their courts using a variant of British common law rather than Sharia law, because they wanted to copy that superior technology. And that was good because the quality of this technology, of how good your laws are, how good your rules are, really matters. This is a picture of South Korea and North Korea at night. You can see one of them is lit up a little bit more than the other. There were no major differences here in the starting culture, the capital, the human resources, or the natural resources. Just a huge difference in rules that led to a huge difference in growth and wealth. We saw the same thing in East and West Germany and in China versus Hong Kong. Rules matter. And something that's come out of economic research in the past few decades, an area called institutional economics, is the idea that rules and culture are actually maybe the main determinants of technological growth and productivity growth. Economists used to think that capital and resources were the most important. Then they started doing regressions and found out that the signs on those were actually pretty small. In fact, resources, ironically, may even be negative. Because when you have lots of resources, you end up with a culture of fighting over access to this fixed pool of resources instead of innovating to produce new things. And the greatest drivers of, of, of wealth and growth seem to be these intangible factors of productivity like rules. So our intuitive focus on intrahuman factors like education and IQ may be misguided. That's, that's intuitive. But if you move a Mexican worker from Mexico to the US, the multiple that their productivity gets is much higher than the difference between, in the US, a high school dropout and someone with a PhD. Can I just ask one question? Um, there's a prize for anybody who can say what all those lights off the coast of Korea are. And if I just told you, you don't get the prize. What's, who said that? Who said that? Who are you? Oh, OK, great. Good job. Sorry. Squid fishing boats. In this room, people driving themselves crazy wondering what it was. Sure. So in addition to the difference between, say, a high school dropout and a PhD being less than a worker moving from Mexico to the US, same goes to the difference between someone with 100 IQ and 150 IQ. The coefficient on what country you live in is actually huge compared to variation between people. So you know, a future super intelligence may well have a much higher productivity multiple, but right now getting people into better systems of rules will actually do more for their productivity than educating them or moderate boosts in intelligence. I shouldn't have to take much time on this in this group. In other groups, people assume that social democracy is the best possible form of government. You know, they're like, 
Well, sure, people used to think that monarchs ruling by divine right was the best form of social organization. But, but really, this democracy, it's the pinnacle. It's the ultimate. It's the best. But if you believe in technology, that's pretty much a ridiculous idea. If this room is the space of all possible forms of social organization that you might imagine, we've explored like this much. And the chance that the, the best form of social organization is somewhere in here is, is minuscule. We may not know what a better form of government is, but we can be pretty sure that it's out there. And that if we experiment, we can find it. I couldn't help making a bad pun, so how can, if government is an information technology, how come it follows the law of less instead of the law of more? Like, who ever heard of an infotech that, that barely advances? So I think of the political world in three kind of layers of meta-ness or of emergent behavior of complex systems. So policies, which is what people mostly waste their time talking about, not that I'm biased, is things like, what should the minimum wage be? What should our health care policy be? The problem is that these policies are emergent behaviors of systems. So there's a whole field of economics called public choice theory, which tells us you know, how democracy is imperfect in certain specific, predictable ways. And I'm just going to do a demonstration to give you like one tiny little piece of public choice economics that will show you how it's an emergent behavior. I need two people from the front row to come sell margaritas on the beach. All right. So the beach goes from that chair to this podium, and people are just kind of spread out all over this beach. And they're going to go to whichever margarita seller is closest to them. And I want you guys to stand so as to try to maximize how many margaritas you sell. So right now, it's, it's split pretty evenly. Split pretty, oh, it's just, just left and right. Split pretty evenly. I think Paul's got a bit more. Paul's got a, oh, Paul's taken over. Paul's got a bit more. Paul's got a bit more. Oh, you can go, you can go around him if you need to. <laughs> okay, and now, oh, look, now it's back to, hey, now it's 50-50. Oh, now it's at equilibrium. Okay, good, stop. So, thank you. So the optimal place for these two margarita sellers on the beach is right in the middle. Because if people will go buy margaritas from whoever's closest, that's what splits the people. And this was an early model proposed for voter preferences. If voters are aligned on some single axis, then the parties want to be right in the center to split the vote. This doesn't explain, this, this is, you know, 2% of the public choice analysis of democracy. But here's the really interesting thing. You know, we know about emergent behavior. We know about how rules dictate emergent behaviors, and sometimes the rules matter more than the desires of the agents. You just saw a little example where the result is the median, right? The two parties want to move right to the middle and reflect the interest of the median voter. That's the emergent behavior of this system given the rules that we've set up. This tells us that Individual preferences, they matter a little bit in this system. It matters what the median is. But this group of people could be over there, or over there, over there. It wouldn't matter. Only the center matters. This is a system for telling us what the center is, which is not the best system. It means a whole lot of information about what people want is getting thrown out. And that's not because we tried to design it this way or because that's what the agents want. It's because that is the logical outcome of that set of rules. And the same thing is true at many other levels in our democracy. So this kind of emergent behavior is not always intuitive. You have to sit down and analyze it. But while our hearts can tell us what values we want from a society, only by using our heads and analyzing things at this kind of level can we figure out how to achieve those values. All right, now let's step up a level from the political system like democracy where you have two parties competing to what I think of as the governing industry. This is all the governments in the world, how they come into being, fade away, and compete. Citizens are the customers, and the public services are the product. Now, my observation is this is an industry that innovates very little, that develops very slowly. And there's certain predictable reasons why. So the first is this industry has a huge barrier to entry. That's the cost of entering the industry. All land is taken, and sovereignty is not for sale. So in order to try out a new government, you have to win a war, an election, a national election, or a revolution. This is a ridiculous barrier to entry. Like, who's going to do a startup when you have to win a war, an election, or a revolution? No one. You can't do self-experimentation. You can't do startups. It's no wonder that there's very little innovation. Like, if you have an industry where Microsoft is one of the smallest firms, how much is that industry going to innovate? Innovation comes from entrepreneurs and startups feeding into the system, even if they get bought by the big companies later. 
Most areas of tech have a, a fairly low barrier to entry and politics doesn't because we've run out of frontier. The other really bad characteristic is customer lock-in. That is, how hard is it to switch providers? It's really easy to switch from one website to another website, right? It's pretty easy to switch car insurance. Nowadays, it's even easy to switch phone carriers. It's pretty damn hard to switch countries. You gotta sell your house, you gotta leave your job, you gotta leave your friends behind. It's really expensive. And again, this kills innovation. How can a startup get customers when it's so expensive for everyone to switch? Any industry with these characteristics is going to be dysfunctional. It has nothing to do with whatever philosophy, whatever crap you want to talk about government, right? Operating systems, they're hard to write. It's hard to switch. There's this high barrier to entry. You have to write this big thing. You have to get all the applications written for it. People have to switch over to learning this new thing, which doesn't run their applications. So you get a new entrant every 10 years, Microsoft, Apple, Linux. The structure of the industry matters. We don't have few operating systems because there's only a few ways to write an operating system. I mean, I know people who write operating systems for fun. You know, geeks like to do it. And it's not because Microsoft is a bad company that Windows is bad. The Xbox is a great product. It's just a product in a competitive industry. So this is, this is a weird way of looking at things, and it, it can be very non-intuitive to kind of look at emergent behavior and look at things as happening, like, not because you know, a bad, anti-competitive Bill Gates is in charge of Windows or because Microsoft sucks or something, but because of the structure of the industry and whether it encourages innovation or not. I see a little bit of a parallel between trying to tweak policies and trying to tweak political systems and learning versus human augmentation, right? So trying to tweak policies has a very limited effect, just like learning with our existing brains. To get these bigger, profound effects, you have to tweak the entire system. Just like to get profound effects at transforming humanity, we need to actually augment ourselves. All right, that's the problem, that's the explanation. How can we fix it? The reason that floating cities on the ocean will help is they fix both of these problems with the industry. The easiest one to see is the barrier to entry. Instead of needing to win a war, an election, or revolution, it takes a few hundred people and tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to do a government startup. That's, that's not easy, but it's a big improvement. And that's the straightforward way that seasteading helps governments. Here's the mind-blowing part. So this is the Royal Caribbean Freedom of the Seas, not the bigger new oasis of the seas, the Freedom of the Seas, and the Empire State Building to the same scale. Keep in mind that buildings we think of as like these huge things that are locked in place. This cruise ship spends its life moving constantly at like 12 to 15 miles an hour. So we can build these ocean cities out of modular, rearrangeable units so that you could change countries without leaving your house. So the companies don't just compete for capital to build new factories, but for the existing factories, for the existing ground that things are built on. If a seastead city starts an unpopular war, the leaders can wake up the next morning and see that the only buildings left are the military barracks and the newspaper offices. These changes to the industry will have an enormous effect. Instead of getting something like the OS industry, where now the government is this cartel, this oligopoly of a few huge firms with no entry and little competition, you'll get something more like Web 2.0. Lots of small startup governments innovating and competing and learning by experimentation what best serves citizens. So seasteading isn't just about running away to the ocean because it's empty. Water is a different medium than land. It has different properties, and building on it will result in a different type of society. All right, <laughs> that was really quick. And I want to briefly point out some of the implications that this rich idea has, and some of the connections with transhumanism. So this is not a utopian idea, because I'm not pushing some specific vision of a better society. It's meta-utopian. In order for this to work, to improve government, there just has to be some better possible government out there. Then we'll experiment and we'll find it. This is sort of a, a humble philosophy in that we don't say we have the answers, but we don't need them. We just need to create a framework in which people can experiment. Like one society startup would be an application. We don't want to make an application. We want to make an infrastructure. There's widespread disagreements over the best values for society. You know, the conflict between security and freedom or total wealth versus equality. But here's the thing, not only will diverse societies in the ocean let us try to achieve diverse ends, but they'll also let us experiment with diverse ways of achieving the same ends. Because it turns out that even if we all agreed on what values we wanted to achieve, it's not clear what 
government technology, what set of laws and institutions 